Yes, it is real. And we are rolling. We're rolling, everybody. Janusz, let, let's, let's warm up with a question that we may or may not need an extra answer to, but um, when we show all of you getting ready in Berg al Arab to go, uh, and then setting sail, what was the feeling like in anticipation of this battle you waited so long for, and did you know where you were going? Yes, we did know where we were going. We knew that we are going to Italy. The feeling was one of excitement, of a dream slowly coming true. That's about all. Was there was there uh, fear? Was there anger? Was there anything for all these feelings that had been in you for so long to make this dream come true? No, there was certainly no fear. There was no anger. Uh, the anger at the Germans was a sort of a permanent feeling. It uh, did not come with the sailing of the ships. It existed before and existed after. We just knew that we are going to Italy to train and to fight. It was a good feeling. In that you felt uh, later how symbolically important the battle was, the Jews could fight and they could win. Before you went into battle, even back when you were training, did you, did you feel the burden? Did you feel that there was that much riding on your shoulders? in some ways the future of so much? No, I don't think so. Look, uh, soldiers, with very few exceptions, perhaps some people who, whose job it was to feel the burden. Soldiers are soldiers. They train, they live their everyday life, they got tired in the evening and slept well at night, and the next day they trained again. We didn't think much about uh, Zionism and uh, about uh, our, what we call in Hebrew, shlichut, our mission. We were just uh, devoted to training so that we be prepared to fight. Well, then something must have happened to create this sense of mission? Was it, was it seeing the survivors? What, what was it? No, look, I'll tell you a joke. You can wipe it off then later on. When I was in Australia, we had a visit of Danny Kay, a famous American actor. And when he left, there were a number of newspaper men at the terminal interviewing him, and one, one Jewish newspaper man asked him, have you got a message for the Australian jury, Mr. K? And Mr. K answered, yes, tell them not to put so much salt in the gefilte fish. That's about the same thing here. I don't think we should talk so much about the mission. Nobody thought about the mission, really. We were talking about going to war, about fighting. Uh, nobody, nobody before a fight and while he is training thinks of missions and uh, Zionism and things like that. We gave ourselves to the, to the training, to the daily life. The mission and the Zionists were in the background. They were there all the time. They didn't all of a sudden burst out because we were in training. So last night, when you looked at the movie with Matthew and I yesterday, and you said, I wish there were more vengeance, I wish there were more Carmi, I wish there were more Zaro, I wish Laskov were alive. Uh, since we're here with you now, and you talk about the desire for vengeance and where it came from so well, I'd love if you just, 
almost tell me the kind of thing that you told everybody last night about this feeling that came over you once you saw the camps. Well, let us divide my remarks into two parts. One were technical remarks. I simply thought that putting certain certain uh, uh, remarks, certain uh, talks uh, of uh, Hotel Ishai would contribute to the film. I think that what Hotel Ishai said was quite significant. It was very interesting. That is one thing. Uh, the second thing, I thought that you should have possibly given more to the problem of vengeance for two reasons. First, because we did it, and I think it should be on record. And secondly, because it is significant and it is important for people to know that we did this act of vengeance, that we didn't forget, that we just didn't lay down and were satisfied with what we have done in the front line. Quite rightly, many people ask themselves and ask others why the Jews didn't resist, why the Jews didn't kill their enemies. And it's a legitimate question and a correct question. And I think that the fact that we, we, we did some vengeance answers in part their questions. Well, again, last night when you were talking to... Could you brush his eyebrows just a little bit? Pardon me? You need to brush, brush your eyebrows a little bit. Last night, you look beautiful now. Yeah. La last night, when you were when you were talking to people at the party, one thing that I think people needed to understand and and picked up on was how you felt because you were among the first into the camps and how this feeling for vengeance came and how strong it was. Because I, I think maybe the movie doesn't really say that well enough. And although Again, you're not Lasko or, or Carmi. You say it so well. I'd love to hear a little bit to give an audience some insight into what you saw and what drove you to this feeling, because it's a surprise. Well, the feeling of anger built gradually. It didn't come all at once. It built up for years. First, when we heard that Hitler is preparing a plan to, 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 we didn't know then it was a plan to exterminate the Jews, but we knew that it's a plan to, to do the Jews a lot of injustice, persecution, and so on. And uh, he, we regarded him as an enemy. Then, when the Germans started physically hurting Jews, burning the synagogues, locking up the Jews in the concentration camps, uh, creating laws discriminating against the Jews, the Nuremberg laws, and so on, then the sense of anger built up and built up. It came to the culmination when we heard of the extermination camps and when we found out from the survivors of the camps what, he, what the Germans in fact did. And then it turned not into an anger, but into fury. And the, everybody began feeling that we owe the Germans something. And then, look, vengeance is a very natural feeling. I don't think why some do-gooders think that vengeance is bad. It's not bad. I think that vengeance is legitimate. 
if you have an enemy who is brutal, who murders your relatives, and he's trying to get out of it unpunished, it's legitimate to kill him. And this is vengeance. I think it's legitimate. The fact that we couldn't do very much was another story. We were serving soldiers in the British Army. We were not masters of our own desires. And we had to do it in such a way that will not do harm to the brigade as a whole and to us as individuals. So we formed this group, not a big one. Everything had to be kept in strict secrecy. Nothing was ever written. We didn't keep any record, any written record. And that was for the purpose that if there is no record, nothing can be discovered. Orders and information were passed by word of mouth. We had a, we had a group of people who were good in collecting intelligence and evaluating it. They collected the intelligence and they were pinpointing the men, the Germans, who were guilty of, uh, of murder, of cruelties and so on. Then we had a sort of a kangaroo court of a few men who considered the evidence and uh, if the evidence called for it, sentenced the man to death. And then another group came into action. Perhaps it's not a nice word, but that's what we were, executioners. A small group went out, found the man and killed him. Without talking to him, without getting involved with him, everything that had to be done was already done. And the last act which had to be carried out was killing him. And that's what we did. When you talk about anger becoming fury, did that come from your first contact with survivors or from seeing the results of the killing, being in the camps or, or seeing people coming to Tarvisio or seeing survivors on the road? Well, both. Both. We were witnesses to both. Many, many members of the Jewish Brigade group went into Germany and Austria and they actually saw the camps. I was in Dachau. I saw, I saw Dachau. I saw, the, I saw the results. And that was a very short while after the war ended. The place wasn't cleaned up yet. It was as dirty as it was when the Germans left it. Dirty, I mean dirty by their deeds. And then, of course, we talked to the survivors, and they told us the stories, the terrible stories. And that, that was the point where the normal anger turned into real fury. The, um, you, that was wonderful. Thank you. You, you did a lot of things other than that in, in um, one of the reasons you had to be secretive was so as not to get the entire brigade in trouble but there was the other reason because whether it was Ben Gurion or whoever said if you do too much of this we'll be in trouble when we try and get reparations. Well there are different reasons in different periods of time. Uh, at the beginning the reason was that it had, it had to be a conspiracy. Nobody, nobody could know about it because the whole brigade would be in trouble. Then when we came back to Israel, the, the reason was different. As you probably remember, Ben Gurion negotiated with the Germans and with Adenauer personally for the reparations and uh, which uh, finally led to the recognition of Germany by the State of Israel and, and, uh, and, uh, and recognition of Israel by Germany. And uh, 
Ben Gurion was firmly against disclosure because it could have torpedoed his talks with the with the with the Germans. When uh, when this uh, period was over, Germany and Israel became a uh, quote unquote friendly states. Each recognized the other, and it would be very awkward if at this particular moment we started talking about it. Now you must also remember that this was not a public knowledge. We were a small group of disciplined men. And if we decided not to talk, nobody talked. We were not gossipers. We were a different, uh, we were a different group of men than the normal crowd. And today, at this, at this time, the reason is again different. In 1997, young people, especially young people, cannot imagine, they cannot visualize, they cannot feel the mood and the circumstances and what we have seen and what we have felt. For them, it would be an outrage. So we prefer to keep quiet again. But right in 1945, when you were in Europe uh, and doing this, was there any pressure from Palestine, from anybody within the Haganah, from anywhere saying, better not do too much of this because we'll be in trouble later with Germany in terms of reparations, or did that all come later? No, we were cut off from, uh, from what was then Palestine. We were cut off from, the, from our institutions. Nobody ordered us anything. It was the initiative and the doing of this small group not more than about 25 people. So what made you stop? Again, the circumstances. You know that the brigade was shifted from Italy to Belgium and to Holland because the British knew that something is going on. Both in the, in the in the subject of vengeance and also the Aliyah bet, the illegal immigration to Israel. And the British thought that if they move us away to the, to the west of Europe, we'll be too far away to do any harm from their point of view. And they were quite right. It became much, much more difficult. Then. The other reason was that the physical situation in Europe changed. In 1945, the frontiers were actually open, they were fluid. Nobody knew exactly who is where and what is where, where the frontiers were. The things were not organized. It took a few months for the powers to get organized, to determine where the frontiers are, and to start guarding them properly few months after the end of war, it was not easy anymore to penetrate the frontiers and to steal the frontiers and to sneak into towns and to do what we had to do. And, the, and then, of course, the brigade was dispersed. And the brigade was dispersed not in one day. We were discharged by, by groups. I, I went home in May 1946. Some people were, went home even before me, and some went after me. So the whole scheme collapsed for the reasons that I have enumerated. So how do you differentiate? Then I want to go to the end, and then we're done. How do you distinguish between the months where you were still in Tarvisio and the, and the many more months when you were actually up in Belgium and Holland? Because we've had trouble determining in the movie what happened when and what was the major shift besides the fact that it got harder. Did you do most of the work in the first few months? Yes, I think that most of the effective work was done in the first few months. As the months passed, <coughs> sorry, it became more and more difficult, very simply. We were less effective. The British were better organized. The British uh, began to, to, to know what is going on. The frontiers were, were closed, 
and the frontiers were better guarded. And I think the first few months after, after the end of the war were the most effective. When we were shifted to Western Europe, we continued the war. We still did a lot of good work, but it was more, much more difficult. <coughs> Excuse me. OK, let's go to the, the last gap we have in the film, which you haven't seen the ending where mm -hmm. we have a number of comments but mm -hmm. questions. Um, I think we're trying to get a clear understanding in as brief a time as you can say it of what you went home and found and what you did to when you were kind of called back into service to help create and train the IDF. And then finally, what is really the legacy of the Jewish Brigade looking back across these 50 years? You can start just with the specifics of, of um, you know, how did you remain important to the future state of Israel when you came home? What did you find? Well, as I told you yesterday, we did not come home as a brigade. When we came home, we were not an organized body. We were individuals. We were five and a half thousand men. Everybody went home to his own business, to his own group. And uh, we ceased to exist as an organized body. And we joined other organized bodies in Israel. Some people went to the kibbutz, some people went to Palmach, some people remained in towns. Everybody, first of all, had to find out how he's going to live, to find a job, to create a family. And we, that kept us very, very, very busy. We contributed. To the, ID, to the IDF again as individuals, not as a body. But these individuals, if not for the brigade, would not have the knowledge and would not have the drive to do what they have done. And again, I think that I said it sometime. I'm sorry again. I, it's okay. There must be some dust here. You can cut it out, huh? Uh, it is my belief, and I think that belief is shared by many in Israel, that if not for the very early actions of the brigade in organizing the illegal immigration to Palestine then, the state of Israel would not come into being. At that time, we were in Israel, less than half a million people. The first wave of the illegal immigration, which the brigade organized, and don't let anybody tell you different, it was not organized from Palestine. It was not organized by a Jewish agency. It was not organized by any organized body in Palestine. It was organized on the spot by the brigade at the brigade's initiative. And this is a fact. A lot of people try to take credit today and claim that it was all organized by the institutions from Israel. That is nonsense. There were no communications. They have no way to organize it. They had no people on the spot. They could take no decisions. We did this all on our own initiative. And we sent the first wave of illegal immigration to Israel, about a quarter of a million to 300,000 men, mostly young men and young women, mostly men. Now, this increased the population of Israel in 1948 by a quarter of a million young people. If not for the quarter of a million young people, we would not have been able to raise an army. The other immigration, 
organized by the institutions in Israel, and I don't detract from it. They did a marvelous job organizing the illegal immigration to Israel, but it came a bit later. The point was to, to, was to have the men at the right time, at the right place. And I think that the brigade takes 100% of the credit for the first wave of illegal immigration. The second thing is it was the brigade who created, who created the desire to emigrate to Israel. We were the, we, we, we were the, the force that led the Jews in Europe know that there is Israel, that there is an organized community in Israel, that there are Jewish soldiers, and that there is a possibility, a feasible possibility, to come to Israel. And they started coming south, to Italy, to France. They concentrated in the ports, and slowly they started infiltrating to Israel. Initially, it was organized by the brigade. Later on, when the brigade left, it was organized by the institutions from Israel, but still with many Jewish brigade men who stayed in Europe after the brigade was dispersed. Wait, are we okay with Israel, or do we want to say Palestine? Is that going to be clear at this point, or is that? That's okay. okay. At this point, we've said it so now, many times. The second part is in Israel. The Jewish brigade men, and to a certain extent other Jewish volunteers to the British Army, were the only people in Israel at that time who knew what a modern army is and how it should function. <clears throat> the others just simply didn't know it. They never saw it. There was no staff college in, in Palestine in those days. Hang on, let's just let that mm -hmm. doorbell stop. <coughs> okay. Go ahead, you can blow your nose again. Pardon? You can blow your nose one more time. Mm -hmm. um, let's go back and just say uh, the, the second point, which is when, you, when the men of the brigade came home they knew about, so we have it as a full thought. The, the men from the brigade and the, particularly the officers were the only people in Palestine in those days who knew what a modern army looks like and how it functions. The only people who knew what is staff work. The only people who knew what is coordination in the field. The only people who knew how to move large bodies of troops around. Haganah and Etzel and Lehi, they operated as individuals or as a very small group, 10 people, 5 people. They haven't had and they didn't understand troops, army in bigger frameworks. And we brought this knowledge and we started educating the Haganah men and others how to do it. Then when the, when the Israeli army with the IDF organized itself, the ex-brigade men uh, took very key positions in it as staff officers, as field commanders, and I think they were the main contribution to the fact that the Israeli Defense Forces organized themselves so quickly. Again, we had no time. We had to organize and be in the field practically overnight. Is that 19, is that 15? Hmm? That's just